Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful to see you all here today. You know, God's doing some really cool stuff around the country these days, and he's, he's very much here, and he's uh, wanting to do things right here in Fairbanks, too. So uh, expect the unexpected with God. You know, if, as long as we try to keep him in a box and try to make him do what we want him to do, then we're going to feel kind of lost because he doesn't fit in boxes very well. <laughs> so let him let him speak to you today. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea
thank you that we can know that it's well with our soul. I thank you, Father, that you are working in us, that you are calling us to a walk with you that, that we could never imagine on our own. Father, I pray you would speak to our hearts. Give us ears to hear you today. We want you to be honored in, in our lives and in, the, and, and in all of Fairbanks. Lord, use us in Jesus' name. If I told you my story, you would hear hope that wouldn't let go. If I told you my story, you would hear love that never gave up. If I told you my story, you would hear life, but it wasn't mine. If I should seek and let it be of the grace that is greater, oh, my sin of which just.
glory. This is my song. I sing my Savior all the day long. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, good morning, Journey. So, uh, I'm here to do the communion of thought, but um, well, when I was writing this, I was thinking to myself, what should I write about? Should I write about the definition of communion? Should I do the possible things that the, the apostles thought about when they were doing communion? But what I thought was, well, I wouldn't say original, but one of the most important things about communion that I would say is an underlying aspect of it is love. You see, sacrifice is the ultimate form of love, and many times it's shown throughout the Bible. For example, Abraham and Isaac. God, God knew Abraham was sinful, and God commanded him to make a sacrifice. His son, the one thing he loved most, the one thing he cherished most, and with this sacrifice, Abraham was tested. He wanted to see if he was willing, if he was willing to give up what he loved most for his God. And he was faithful. But in the end, he did not have to, ask, he did not have to sacrifice his son. He simply gave up a goat. It was a satisfying ending. But the story of Jesus Christ is not one where the day is saved. It is a day where we are saved not Jesus. You see, when Christ came to the world, he was not here to have a great life. He was here to endure and have a painful, hard life because of us. You see, one of the greatest things that he did was not teach, though that was great. It was not, it was not expose us of what we are. It was to come and to solve a problem, even if it was not known. And by that, Christ died on the cross for us. He repaid the sin. He repaid the price we all developed over time of sinning. He paid it fully and totally. I'm sure God would not want his son to die, but because God is a just God, because God is a good God, that price, that price had to be prayed, paid. And because that was there, Christ had to die. And by this, communion represents the final foreshadowing of Jesus Christ's death, like Abraham and Isaac. His, the bread represents his body that was nailed to the cross because of our sinful ways. The blood, which is the wine, represents the blood that was poured out on for us to cover our evil ways, our evil sin that scorned us. And in this, communion represents the final final example and final teaching of Jesus Christ that he is here to save us above all else. That he is here to do what we cannot, which is to save ourselves. He was there to save us. So I want you to think about that today. I want you to remember that communion above all else is the final foreshadowing of Jesus Christ's sacrifice for us. Now today we're here to celebrate communion early in the morning. We have two communion stations on the left and right side which you guys can form lines onto. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this time you've given us today, Lord. Thank you for the sacrifice of your son that you have given us, Lord. Thank you for the lessons he's taught us of sacrifice of the, as the ultimate love, Lord. Thank you for his time with us, his patience with us, 
above all else is love with us, Lord. And may I pray, amen. I would like to share a story with you about a time that I was teaching in Jerusalem and Galilee in these areas. And I was teaching to tax collectors. And because we're in polite company, those which we call sinners. So I was teaching them the good news that the kingdom of God had drawn near to men. And there were those who saw me who we would call the righteous. They were the teachers of the law. They were the keepers of God's moral, excellent law. And they saw me teaching these people and muttered to themselves, this man sits with sinners and even eats with them. So I told them three stories. And the first is this, is that suppose a shepherd goes out and he's watching over his flock and he counts them up and he says he gets to 99 and he realizes that one is missing. Does he not leave the 99 and go look for the one? And he will search high and low and thistles and thorn bushes and crags and rocks until he finds that sheep. And when he finds it, he rejoices 
and he picks it up and puts it on his shoulders and he carries it back and calls everyone together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. And I tell you that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than 99 who do not need repentance. Or suppose there's a woman who has 10 coins and she loses one. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house until she finds it? And when she does find it, she's overjoyed and she calls her friends and says, come and celebrate with me. I have found my lost coin. I tell you, the angels in heaven rejoice when a sinner repents, when one who is lost is found. Or suppose there's a man, and this man has two sons. And the younger son approaches the father and he says, Father, I want my share of the estate. Well, the father divides it up and he gives the son his inheritance and immediately the son takes it and he goes to a distant land and he squanders it on wild living now it doesn't take long to lose a fortune at wild living so he becomes destitute and he's broke and he has to feed himself so he gets hired out by a local citizen to feed pigs and there he is knee-deep in the muck of pigs, feeding them pea pods. And he longed to eat those pea pods, but no one would give him any. So he comes to his senses, and he realizes, the servants in my father's house have food to spare, and here I am starving to death, so I will go home, and I will tell my father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And as he was approaching home, the father saw him from a long way off. And the father ran to him, and he threw his arms around him, and kissed him and the son said father I have sinned against heaven and against you I am no longer worthy to be called your son and the father said servant go get the best robe and throw it on him put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet for my son who was dead is alive my son who was lost is found kill the fattened calf for we will feast and celebrate so while all this was happening, the older son, the older brother was in the field working, tending his duties. And as he's walking back to the house, he hears the, the, the celebration. And he asks one of the servants, he says, hey, what's all the hullabaloo? And the servant says, oh, you haven't heard? Your brother has returned. He has come back from death to life. He was lost, but now he is found. And so your father has killed the fattened calf, and we are celebrating. And the brother, the son, was enraged. He was angry, and he went out to the field, and he refused to go in and celebrate. So the father realizes he's missing one of his sons. He goes to the field. He says, my son... Why are you so angry? Why won't you come in and celebrate? And he says, Father, my whole life I have done what you have asked me to do. I have worked in your fields. I have kept your rules. And now your son squandered your wealth on prostitutes. And you expect me to be glad that you have killed the fattened calf? when you never even gave me a goat to celebrate with my friends. And the father said, my son, my son, 
You have always been with me. And everything I have is yours. We must celebrate. Because my son, your brother, was dead. But now he is alive. My son, your brother, was lost. But now is found. We must celebrate. <clears throat> All right, at this time, children and teens, you can head out. Oh, sorry, teens stay. This is the last Sunday of the month. Children, you can head out for your classes. So, teenagers stay. A couple things there's a prayer room right there after the service if you would like prayer. And if you have questions about the church, there's a next step area right in the lobby. I encourage you to stop in there, and there's a free gift if it's your first time here today. I encourage you to do that. Appreciate Evan being Jesus today. I never knew Jesus said hullabaloo. That's good to know. It must be in the Greek. It must be in the Greek somewhere. A um, couple things in the bulletin. There's an invite card. Please remember, next Sunday, we switch worship times. So we go to 9 and 11. So if you show up at 10, you're either really late or really early. So uh, 9 and 11 next week. And so we're going to give that a try and see how that goes. Also in the bulletin, not going to spend a lot of time, but I, I just, I mean, we know these things. I want to make sure you know these things. We had an amazing year, 2022. If you want to read through this, this is kind of a recap um, just to, I'll mention a couple items, just I think were fun. Um, we don't typically do week-long VBSs, but we had one of our biggest VBSs ever. Um, our son, uh, Tony Dickinson, a young guy, um, did a Becoming a Man conference, and he was really praying and hoping. Uh, it was about, you know, teaching teenage boys how to become a godly man. And he put that together, and he was hoping for 50 teenage boys. We had like 75, and with the dads and father figures that came, it was over 100. Uh, and so that was super exciting. Uh, teen group, Marcy and her team took the largest group ever of Journey Teens to go down to the Fusion Conference in um, Anchorage. God's been very gracious to us financially. Uh, we had a capital campaign where we... Uh, set out to raise 150000 to pave the parking lot in the summer, and we did raise that. Um, of course, it was with the inflation stuff, it was way more than we thought. It ended up being 261000 uh, God was not surprised, even though we were, and we were able to pay that in cash. Another financial blessing is that in 2022, uh, we paid extra payments whenever we felt like, okay, things are going well, the elders would... Um, authorize an extra payment. We paid $100,000 extra on our principal on our mortgage in 2022. So that was pretty amazing, uh, pretty encouraging. And they just signed off on making an extra payment um, this week of $10,000. So we continue to work on that. Uh, food pantry, one of our big ministries, had a major improvement. We put in a walk-in freezer. It's out back if you haven't seen it. Um, about $20,000, and that came in designated, and people who gave time and, and gifts and kinds. And we're the largest uh, distribution point, is my understanding, for the Fairbanks Food Bank, uh, with last year being 122,185 pounds of food given to families that need it. So that was pretty exciting. Largest Thanksgiving giveaway ever. Um, that was 300 struggling families received those. A church planting, George Johnson of the CEA, who we work with to plant churches across the Northwest, said in our 18-year 18, 18 history, uh, in 2022, we planted, um, had a hand in planting our 30th church in the Pacific Northwest, so that was exciting. Uh, Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday, we had our Messianic Passover meal with a couple other churches, had 250 people that sold out uh, for that event. Uh, teens led a Sunday sundown worship service, and that was uh, great to see. You just heard one of the teenagers who did the communion thought today. He, he spoke at that service. 
Um, we offered two worship services, had 412 people between them on Easter, had five baptisms that day. Uh, just, there are just a lot of things. One of my favorite things about this church I've never seen in an American church is for years now, we have a prayer group that meets every single morning at 7 a.m. And it's not big, but we just pray over this church and over the community and for our country. And that's been a powerful thing. Uh, we had some staffing additions, but you can just read through this. There are some challenges. Every year has a few challenges. And then I give you some goals for 2023, and you're welcome to read through those. If you have any questions on any of this, you can certainly come to me. But, you know, we're trying to settle the second um, service question, and so we're trying 9 and 11. Uh, we're going to try to raise our evangelistic efforts, specifically Goldstream area, um, the UA University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, trying to make an effort more with the military. Um, I actually just, in between the services, because I said the wrong name, I figured out I've been in ministry since 92, so that's, that's like three decades, and... Um, uh, they recommend you go on a sabbatical every seven years, and I've had one, so I am taking a, a second sabbatical in my career this summer, June, July, and August, so I'll step away, and um, Evan will do a lot of the preaching, but we'll have different ones, some of our elders and, and different individuals take care of that, and George Johnson, the head of the Christian Evangelistic Association, is going to be up here to kind of help manage with some of the day-to-day -day things for those three months. Uh, so just so you're aware that that's coming, we're hoping to appoint two or three new elders in uh, 2023. Uh, we only have three elders at the moment, and at our size, we probably should have a couple more. So we're working on that. We think that'll get done in the next few months. And then uh, campus improvements this year, uh, we're going to put a fountain out in the pond and a walking bridge back in that section over the big ditch and power wash the exterior and building and reseal it all. So I'm going to have some help with a mission team on that. And then a miracle goal that I've been praying for for the last several years is that God would pay off our mortgage entirely. Um, that would free us, you know, to, you know, that I think it's 14 thousands five hundred is what's required of us a month uh, on mortgage and we always pay just to kind of uh, towards principal we always pay sixteen thousand five hundred a month and then often extra even beyond that um, and so we're trying to you know just get rid of that but imagine what we could do staffing or church planting or missions if we could get rid of that debt so we continue to pray for god to pay that off so those are some of the goals if you have questions about that, you can see me. So I just wanted to kind of click through it. Um, it was 2022 was an amazing year, thanks to your volunteering, your serving, your prayers, your giving, and grateful for that. I just wanted you to have a little glimpse of it uh, because you know if you feel tired, there, there's a reason. And so now you know. And uh, but it was a good year in many many ways. Uh, to give you some context, at the beginning of the document. The American church really has struggled the last uh, couple years. Uh, many, many churches closed. Many. Uh, COVID finished them off. Uh, a lot of churches, I, personally, most ministers I chat with, they're down 30 or 40 percent. Uh, from pre-COVID. We grew through COVID, um, and God has been very kind to us. So I just um, wanted to give you a, a little bit of an update there. So uh, God has been very gracious. All right, let's pray, and we'll get into our message. There is an outline in the bulletin if that helps you. Dear God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for 2022 and what you have done among us. Lord, I thank you for the many that I met with to do individual spiritual plans, and just that that heart to, to be fully yours, to live out the life you have called us to. Lord, we are grateful for how you have provided for us, how you have encouraged us and called us forward. Lord, help us to be uh, light in this community. Help us to share the gospel with all those around us and to look for places where we can go and to just spread good news. And so we just ask this. We ask your blessing and your Holy Spirit to do his work among us this morning. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So the stories that uh, you just heard, the parables, which I was taught as a kid in church, that a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. 
Jesus would make up stories, uh, these parables, in order to make a point or two. You don't get too bogged down in the details. You just want to grab a few ideas from them. And he would use these stories to drive home a point. Now, what was happening, as, as Evan mentioned, is that the religious people, the moral people, the Pharisees in particular, were aggravated. They were upset when they see Jesus in particular eating with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes, those that were kind of the notorious sinners of their culture. Now, tax collectors, we're not, you know, most of us are not like, hey, I want to go hug an IRS worker. But, but they, it was a lot worse because they were an oppressed people by the Romans. And so a tax collector was someone who was a turncoat, someone who worked with the Romans, someone who kind of had their little franchise, their little section, and they would, if they were with us, you know, they would have this little section of town, and we would all pay the taxes, and they would jack up the taxes and take that, they would skim off of it in order to become quite wealthy and impoverish the people that they worked around. So the, the tax collectors were absolutely hated, and yet Jesus invited Matthew or Levi in as a tax collector to become part of his inner 12. And he welcomed him. And I'm sure that there were moments at the beginning as they tried to navigate this that Simon the Zealot, because the Zealots in that day and age were ones that would, like, you know, if they got a chance, they would slit the throat of a Roman soldier or a tax collector. And so they probably had to watch Simon the Zealot and not leave him alone with Matthew in the early days. But they learned in their, in their commitment to Jesus Christ to get along and to love each other. But these stories were aimed directly at the Pharisees and scribes, the moral people of the day, these stories about lostness and the joy of being found. Now, a little cultural detail that helps you with this, the second story that he mentioned about the woman who had a coin and she lost the coin. She tears the house apart to find the coin. You might be like, what is that all about? You know, I haven't looked under my sofa cushions in quite some time. There's probably quite a bit there. But it would be similar culturally. Uh, a married woman in Jewish culture would like wear this headdress that have coins, according to one source I was reading. And to lose, have a coin fall out of that and to lose that is similar to if you lose your wedding ring. And so that, that it's something really valuable. And so that helps you understand. And also the coin, Warren Wearsby, we don't want to get too bogged down in the details on a parable, but I did appreciate what he said. He said a coin would have the image of a ruler on it, the ruler of the land. And so, in a sense, it's kind of pointing us to the idea that, you know, the, the coin, when, you, when something is lost, when a person is lost, we all bear the image of God. It doesn't matter how marred or broken or maybe there's mental difficulties, maybe there's addiction. It doesn't matter what a person looks like or the situation they find themselves in, but every person has that imprint of the image of God on them. And they are valuable and they matter. Now, the third parable is the parable that most call the prodigal son. I actually prefer calling it the story of the two lost sons because both, I think the point, and we'll get to more of this, but the point is about two sons that were lost in different ways, not just the one in kind of the obvious way, taking his dad's money and, and running her off. But also, I think even a better title would be the parable of the loving father, because here's this father that loves both of his boys who are lost in different ways. So when I look at these three stories, these three parables that Jesus gives, I think the first main idea is God's surprising love. His surprising love for everyone. The first part being that, that the gospel is for everyone. That God offers a welcoming love. Notice in Luke 15, 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. In our culture, it doesn't have quite 
the impact that it did then. But table fellowship was a huge deal. It was an offer of acceptance. It was saying, you are my friend. And for Jesus to have table fellowship with tax collectors, with prostitutes, with people who were the notorious sinners of their day was shocking to the religious and the moral. And so we need to understand this, that the gospel is for everyone. That person that you don't like, that person that you think maybe has gone too far, that person who is difficult, the gospel is for that person as well. It doesn't matter who they are. And so it's absolutely crucial that we see that everyone has immense and incredible value. As you heard of the communion thought, Jesus paid the ultimate price he died on a cross for every single person so they could be forgiven from their sins. Now, I was reading a guy, Simon Ponsby, and he was talking about the Apostle John in his gospel. He refers to himself as the apostle who Jesus loved. And Simon said, he goes, I would read that. And he goes, I, I struggle with some inadequacy um, issues and being like left out of the inner circle. And he goes, that just really irritated me. He goes, you know, here's John. Is John saying that, that Jesus loved him the most, that he was Jesus' best friend? What is he saying here? And he really struggled this till one day he was in his prayer time and he just felt like the Lord kind of opened up what was going on there. And the idea was this. He felt like he, he heard or sensed, uh, Simon, I don't love John any more than I love you. The only difference is that he knows he is loved. That at the core of the Apostle John's identity, this son of thunder, I mean, this is a guy who had some anger issues, this son of thunder, he knew he was loved by Jesus Christ. And that became what he grabbed a hold of. And so we see that the gospel is for every single person. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter what moral codes you've shattered. Doesn't matter um, the mistakes that you've made. I think of Peter, the great outspoken apostle who denied Jesus three times, and Jesus welcomed him back. He reinstated him. He offered him forgiveness and restoration. And so this is remarkable. There's a song I like, uh, Matthew West, talks about the God who stays. Some of the lyrics are, you're the God who stays. You're the one who runs in my direction when the whole world walks away. You're the God who stands with wide open arms. You tell me nothing I have ever done can separate me from the God who stays. And so the gospel is for every person, whether you click with them, whether you connect with them or not. Uh, Friday, had a guy pop in here at the church, and it, this happens occasionally, it's not all the time, but uh, a homeless person will come by, a person struggling in that regard. And, you know, we'll offer food or pray with them or just do whatever we can, just listen. But this particular gentleman, uh, I have a hard time with. I caught him stealing out of my car. There just have been some issues. And there have been times that, you know, we try to be kind and I just feel like it has not worked. And I, as I'm thinking about this and studying this, I'm like, really, that's who shows up Friday, you know. And, but we had a good visit. And I got to pray with him. And I had to kind of work on my attitude. And it's, it's hard to come alongside people that you don't click with or have wronged you. But the gospel is for everyone. God goes to incredible lengths to seek lost people. Notice that in all these stories, there is an initiative taken by the God figure, by you know, one that represents God's love. You see the shepherd who goes after the lost sheep. You see the woman who lost the coin going after the lost coin. You see the father who in a culture where men did not run, you know, children might run, but you didn't see a patriarch, you know, in this ancient culture run. But when he sees his son, he runs to him. That is profound and powerful. You see that, that initiative that God takes you know, just a side note, um, I like to walk a lot, but if you see me running, you ought to run too. I'll just say that. <laughs> just trying to help you out if something goes wrong. Now, God goes to incredible lengths to seek lost people. This is amazing 
that this father runs to his son. This son had disgraced the family. Now, this is a made-up story. It's a parable. But if this were a true story, if this were to happen in a Jewish community, this would be an absolute mess. This younger son is coming to dad saying, Dad, I want the stuff, and basically, I, I don't want you. I wish you were dead so I could get my inheritance. And in that system, my understanding is, as the younger son, he would have gotten a third of the estate. And the oldest boy would have gotten two-thirds of the estate. Now, I'm an oldest. I think this is a wonderful system. Americans should consider it. But anyway, but the only way to do that in that ancient Jewish culture would have been to sell the land, sell part of the land. And so this would have been public this would have been disgraced. This son is saying he wants my stuff, and so I'm going to sell a part of the land so that he can have it, and then he takes it. He goes to a far-off country. He rejects his own people, and because the Jewish people had a special relationship with God, a covenant with God, he's rejecting God. And this son goes off and wastes this money on wild living, when he comes back, one, one piece you might not know culturally, when he comes back, that father running to him, that could, in a Jewish setting, save his life. Because for a son to disobey and disgrace a father like this and to disgrace a family like this, this son would have been in danger of the rest of the village coming together and stoning him to death. But in that father's love for him and in his grace, he runs to him. And so you're not going to stone him if dad's hugging him and kissing him. And so God goes to incredible lengths to reach lost people. The incarnation is the ultimate example. God the son was in heaven being worshipped all the time. And he had to take on flesh, the mystery of the incarnation. He, here he is, God the son, and forever eternal, and he takes on flesh as a baby and allows himself to be dependent, taken care of by most likely a teenage mother because they married young, and, and Joseph, they were peasants. They were Jewish people oppressed by the Romans, so he's part of an oppressed group. To step into that, to live life on our terms, to suffer to be rejected by his own people, to die a criminal's death on a cross, all for us, that is quite a journey. That is God going as far to extreme measures in order to save lost people. Thomas Mott Osborne, back in October of 1914, entered the Auburn prison in upstate New York. He'd been um, assigned to work with prisoners and try to help the corrections uh, center uh, and system by the governor. And he decided that I'm going to go voluntarily become a prisoner for a period of time just to see what life is like, just so I can help these prisoners. And so he went and he served just a, a short period of time, even did solitary confinement, you know, in the box. And he did these things so that he could come out and better serve on a much more extreme level, God the Son took on flesh. God the Son lived life on our terms to go to these incredible lengths to take the initiative to reach lost people. Now, we get to the two sons in the final story, the prodigal son. So you have these two sons, and we, we think about this story and we look at the younger brother and we're like, that's kind of our traditional perception of sin and separation from God. That's our traditional picture of lostness. This rebel, while living, wasteful living, all of that. And he's, he's, he's that. He walks that out completely. And so he basically commits treason against his father and his family, and he wrecks his life. And then notice in Luke 15, 20, it says, So he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion. And that phraseology is said about Jesus over and over again in the Gospels, is filled with compassion, that love for someone who's, who's hurting. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. This is incredible. 
that he offers him this salvation. What does he do in Luke 15, 22 through 24 for this younger son? But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe. One image of salvation is the robe of righteousness. It's found in Isaiah that we, we wear the robe of righteousness. We wear, in a sense, the blood of Christ. He, God looks at us and he doesn't see all our sins. He sees the righteous life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Put a ring on his finger. The ring was a family signet ring. He is giving him sonship. Now what's interesting is in his repentance, this son, you know, when he is looking at the pigs and, look, and he's hungering for the pig's food, and he's like, you know, I should go home. Even the servants have it better there. And he, in his mind, he does what we have a tendency to do. I'll, I'll earn it. I'll go back and say, hey, Dad, I'll be a hired hand. I'll be a servant. I'll, I'll earn my way back into your good gracious. And he starts down that road. He confesses his sin, but he starts down that road, and his dad cuts him off. The father cuts him off and gives him sonship. Put on a robe. Give him a ring. Put sandals on his feet. Let's have a party to celebrate. They didn't just eat meat left and right like the American diet. You know, to... That fatted calf was saved for special occasions. That was a big deal. And so here he, he offers sheer grace to his son. You see, when you go to Christ, you have empty hands. Don't you dare show up with a spiritual resume. I did this, I did that, I didn't know. You show up with empty hands. It is a gift. It is sheer grace. Now, the older brother, the older brother is lost through self-righteousness and pride. Now, when I do individual spiritual plans with people, one question I often ask, not every time, but I often say, hey, the story of the, you know, the two sons, the loving father, the prodigal son, whatever title you want to use for it, in Luke 15, which son do you identify with? And I love to hear people's response to that. Which son do you identify with? The younger son or the older son? Because it tells me something about your spirituality. It tells me something about your heart. And I'll just admit, grew up in the church, tried to follow God wholeheartedly. I've got older son tendencies. This older son is lost in his relationship to the father through self-righteousness and pride. He's pretty obedient, but the older son, he didn't have his father's heart. Notice Luke 15, verse 28. The older brother became angry, refused to go in, because he hears the party, refuses to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. Now, I think there's a strong tie between an Old Testament story that's historical and this New Testament parable of the two sons. The Old Testament story is the story of Jonah. If you grew up in church, you know the story. If not, very quickly, basically Jonah is a Jewish prophet. He's called by God to go preach to Nineveh. Nineveh was a wicked, wicked city. The Nazis of the Old Testament. They hated the Jews. The Jews hated them. And Jonah gets a command by God, go preach to Nineveh. And what does Jonah do? He acts like a younger son for the first two chapters of Jonah. He runs the exact opposite direction. I'm not going. Gets on a boat, big storm. They throw him overboard to calm the sea, and a big fish, a whale, uh, swallows him up, spits him up on the shore eventually. And now, somewhat repentant Jonah, his attitude still you know, stinks a little bit, but... He goes and he preaches. So he acts like a younger son, first couple chapters, disobeying God. Then he goes, he preaches to Nineveh. Nineveh has one of the most outstanding, incredible, shocking revivals in all of human history. The whole town, just the whole city, they, they repent. And they're like, 
oh my. And his message, his sermon didn't really even have that in it. It just, they're like, well, he wouldn't, God wouldn't have sent a messenger to tell us our city's going to be destroyed if there wasn't a way to stop it. And so they repent from the king on down. And what does Jonah do? Jonah goes outside the city. He wants to watch the city destroyed by God. He gets out there. God has a little plant come over him, offer him some shade, just sheer grace. And he sits out there with his arms crossed. All right, that's not in the text, but I think it's in there. And he's mad because they repented and God forgave him and spared the city. And he just rolls right from younger brother to an older brother heart. Lord, these are notorious sinners. These people are vicious in war. We know that that group, they were just vicious. And what's interesting is that the conversation that God has with Jonah, it ends on a cliffhanger, just like this parable. It ends on a cliffhanger. Jonah, we don't know how it all ends. He's kind of, he's like, I want to die. I mean, what kind of preacher wants to die because the people responded to his message. I mean, isn't that bizarre? And we don't know, does Jonah ever repent? Or is it just the Ninevites? Cliffhanger. Roll it forward to this parable. Older brother. Party going on. Younger brother had repented. Younger brother's home. Dad is thrilled. This is one of the greatest days of dad's life. And what does older brother do? Can't stand my younger brother. He's, he's just a mess. And he stays out. Blocks himself off from his family. Blocks himself off from his father. And his father comes out and tries to convince him to come in. Now let me give you a detail that maybe doesn't just leap out at you, but I want you to think about this. If the younger son, because I think this helps with why he's so angry, part of it, the younger son, when he asked for the inheritance, you know, they would have had to sell off property and give the inheritance. So everything that's left, fatted calf, party wine, whatever, whose is that going to be eventually? The older brother's. So the older brother is paying for, at least that's the way I think he's processing this. And so that's part of his struggle with this. So both end on a cliffhanger. Is the person who's been more obedient, is the person, is that person who's separated and their relationship with God is broken because of their self-righteousness and their pride, are they going to respond? Now, if you track the Pharisees, for the most part, not all of them, but for the most part, they reject Jesus. The older brother refuses to enter the party. The second big idea is God's joy. Notice how God cares about this. Cares about us. Cares about people. He wants the lost to come to him. Luke 15, 5, 6, and 7. And when he finds it, this is talking about the shepherd, so this is the first parable. He finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. I'll be honest, I don't love that last line. I mean, it's Jesus speaking, so I'm, you know, he's Jesus, I'm not. But it's a little confusing You've got to look at all of Scripture and understand everyone has sin in their lives. But the righteous don't think they have any sin. They're so self-righteous. They're so proud. They don't think they're sick. You know, another time Jesus says, he goes, I'm here for the sick, you know, not the healthy. If I show up and I have good news, I have good news. I have the cure for cancer, this particular cancer. You're like, well, I don't have cancer. You're not that excited about it, right? But if you have cancer, this is life. This is good news. 
The reality is we all have spiritual cancer. It's called sin. We all have done it. There is joy in the finding. There is joy in finding this lost sheep. C.S. Lewis once said about joy, joy is the serious business of heaven. God loves to find lost people. In Luke 15, 32, it says, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So that's in the parable, the third parable of the two sons. And I love that. Notice the joy when someone accepts, when someone comes home, when someone's no longer dead, but they're alive. Many of you are parents. You ever lost a kid in a store or you're out camping and it might be just a few minutes or it might be a few hours? That is gut-wrenching. And when you find them, you are overwhelmed with joy. Back in the terrorist attack of 9-11, for days, maybe even weeks after in New York City, they had you know, all these posters of people's pictures and it just would say at the top, often lost. And those families were heartbroken, like is my loved one in the Twin Tower? Where is my loved one? Are they dead? Are they alive? Are they trapped? That lost. But when you find, there's incredible joy. The woman in Luke 15, the, the parable of the woman looking for the coin, verse 9 and 10, when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I've found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. God wants all of us to have relationship with him. He is thrilled when someone responds to him. He rejoices when the relationship that was broken by sin is restored. And his point, one of his points to these Pharisees is the fact that you're grumbling that the notorious sinners are responding means you're not part of the kingdom. So what is our response? Our response is to repent. And I know that's kind of an old Bible word, but it's a good word. We need to repent towards God and repent towards others. Repent is a change of mind, literally. I think a good image is you're going one direction, and I think this is the right way, and I realize, oh, this is away from God. And to repent is to make a U-turn. It's to change my thinking. It's to change my mind. And that leads to a changed action and changed life. Notice we see the word repent over and over again, Luke 15, 7. It says, more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents. In 15.10, um, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents. So this is the calling. We see repentance in the heart of the younger son. Luke 15, verse 18, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He was doing his own thing. He was going his own way, and it hits him, and it takes being destitute it takes being completely broken or it hits him and he's like, I had a good thing going. I need to make a U-turn here. I need to go back. One author, one theologian, William MacDonald said this. He said about the, um, those that repent, we take sides against ourselves with Christ. We take Christ's side against ourselves. We quit justifying our behavior, our selfishness, our pride, our self-righteousness, whatever it is in our lives that's putting up a barrier with God, and we are called to repent. We see this word pop up throughout the Gospels, throughout the New Testament. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the apostle Peter, the Holy Spirit has come, and they're cut to the heart because he has gotten in their face and said, hey, you killed your Messiah. And all these people, like, what do we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A chapter later, in Acts chapter 3, verse, 30, uh, verse 19, the apostle Peter again is speaking. He says, repent then, turn to God, so your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. If you're going away from God, if you're defying God, if you're so arrogant that you think you haven't ever 
committed sin, it's time to repent, to change your thinking and change your direction. And we need to repent in that attitude towards others as well. Do we dream God's dream that as many as possible would be saved? Do we look at that person that maybe has mental illness issues and is really hard to deal with and think they are valuable and they matter to God? Do we look at that person that's maybe mired in addiction and we think they'll never respond? God wants them to respond. They can respond. He's taking the initiative. I remember sitting with an old man, and he'd probably been a chronic alcoholic for um, decades. And I just remember thinking, you know, we had this conversation, and he just wouldn't accept any responsibility. I just thought, how are you going to repent? How are you going to act? And it's just heartbreaking. And so the question of the final parable is, will the older son go to the party? And we don't know the answer in the parable. We know how it turns out for most of the Pharisees. And I think it's like those books that I did when I was a kid. I don't know if you did them, but they're like you make decisions. Like you, you read the book and, okay, you can decide. If you decide to go this direction, you go to page 23. If you decide this direction, go to page 33. And you chart your own story, so to speak. Okay, there you go. And I would read those, and I enjoyed those because you get to determine you get to make decisions. And so this parable, older brother, that's one thing. But if you have older brother tendencies like I do, how are you going to answer that? So the big idea this morning is this. Younger brothers, welcome home. Older brothers, do you have a heart like God's? It's time for you to join the party. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for each person here. Lord, you long to have relationship with each of us. You know our particular brokenness, our particular sinfulness, whether it looks blatant and flagrant and rebellious or whether it's cleaned up and self-righteous and we're up to our necks in pride. Lord, change our minds. Change our hearts. Help us to be a repentant people that accept your offer of sheer grace. Lord, this is our prayer in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
son for redemption, the price for my heart. I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand. you have a wonderful week. Greet, greet some folks on the way out. My heart has been in your sight.